Good evening or good afternoon as the case may be. And thank you for joining us for the virtual and socially distanced Africa Day Memorial Lecture of the University of the Free State for 2021. My name is Dr. Stephanie Kaywood, Director of the Center for Gender and Africa Studies. On 25 May next week, we will celebrate the 58th Africa Day since its inception in 1963 with the founding of the Organization of African Unity, the forerunner of the African Union. The Africa Day Memorial Lecture is one of the flagship academic events on the calendar of the University of the Free State since the very first one delivered in 2009 by Professor Ashil Mbembe. Over the years, we have been honoured to host some of the greatest African intellectuals of their generation, including Professors Ali Mazrui, Mahmoud Mamdani and Anyangugi Wathiongo, to name a few. We are truly honoured to have Professor Walter D. Mignolo deliver the lecture this year, albeit virtually, as the circumstances demand. Now more than ever, Africa Day serves as a reminder that the destiny of every nation and every soul in Africa is a collective fate, intimately tied with the future of the African continent, and that acting together in the face of great adversity, such as we are currently living through, will have greater power than standing alone. Therefore, the theme for the Africa Month celebrations of the University of the Free State this year is solidarity in knowledge production and recording. We stand in solidarity with the University of Cape Town that has suffered great losses to its African Studies collection with the recent devastating fires in Cape Town. Their loss is our collective loss. Therefore, preserving African knowledge and wisdom is also our collective responsibility. The idea of Africa transcends geographic boundaries and is present across the world in the hearts, minds and networks of its children in the African diaspora. Therefore, when we speak of African solidarity, we also include the African diaspora, which also serves as the inspiration for today's lecture. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Francis Peterson, Director and Vice-Chancellor of the University of the Free State, to open the program. Welcome to our Africa Day Memorial Lecture. This lecture is the flagship event of our Africa Month events and is hosted by the University of the Free State Centre for Gender and Africa Studies. So on the 25th of May 2021, Africa will celebrate the 58th anniversary of the Organization of African Unity, the predecessor of the African Union. A central tenet of the organization is African solidarity. While we were preparing for the 2021 Africa Month, we learned about the damage to the University of Cape Town's African Studies collection in the Jagger Library reading room. To help mitigate this immense loss, the theme of the 2021 University of the Free State Virtual Africa Month celebration is Solidarity in Knowledge Production and Recording. Much of our Africa Month celebrations are focused around this particular theme. The University of the Free State prides itself on being an African university and it is important for us to pay tribute to this significant month for the continent. We want the best for Africa by doing excellent research with an impact to the benefit of Africa and Africans. This vantage point elevates the importance of our university in researching questions that are critical to the development of the continent in a wide array of fields such as astronomy, biodiversity, climate change, plant sciences, indigenous knowledge systems, poverty and inequality, and sustainable agriculture. We also take pride in the cohort of students from African countries outside South Africa studying here especially the many postgraduate students who have graced us by selecting the University of the Free State as their university of choice. The university's flagship event for this month is the annual Africa Day Memorial Lecture. In keeping with the theme, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our guest lecturer, Professor Walter McNollo. Professor McNollo 
is a Wanamaker Professor of Literature and Director of the Centre for Global Studies and the Humanities at Duke University in the United States. His lecture entitled Beauty of the Sovereign People, Jean Casimir and the Decolonial History of Haiti, delivered virtually this year, will honour the memory of transatlantic slavery by reflecting on Professor and former Ambassador Jean Casimir of Haiti. He shifted the geography of reasoning by breaking the code of standard history of the slave trade, the African diaspora in the Caribbean, and of captive human beings in the plantations. The discussion will be the extraordinary professor in our Centre for Gender and Africa Studies and Professor of Epistemologies of the Global South at Beirut University, Professor Sabelu Nglobo Gatseni. Professor Magnolu, we are grateful that you took the time to share your knowledge with us. And also thank you to Professor Nglobo Gatseni for leading this discussion. I would also like to thank Professor Heidi Hudson, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Dr. Steffi Kaywood, Director of the Center for Gender and Africa Studies, and staff, as well as other participants, who helped to realize this event. Since COVID-19 continues to ravage the world, fostering African solidarity appears to be particularly worthwhile. So thank you for all showing an interest in this worthy event. I know that you will enjoy the lecture and be enriched by what you learn. Thank you, Professor Peterson. While the Africa Day Memorial Lecture is very much aimed at intellectual reflection, Africa Day is also about celebrating the best in African music, art and culture. The Faculty of Humanities at the University of the Free State hosts excellent arts and music programs and has produced outstanding talent over the years. I'm therefore very proud to introduce the award-winning Adayan String Quartet, playing the traditional African hymn, Iboyili i Afrika, meaning Africa Returns. I would now, now like to invite Professor Heidi Hudson, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, to introduce our speaker, Professor Mignolo, and our topic for tonight. The Faculty of the Humanities at the University of the Free State is honoured to welcome and introduce Professor Walter D. Mignolo, renowned decoloniality scholar, as the 2021 
keynote speaker in our annual Africa Day Memorial Lecture Series. The so-called decolonial turn in recent years started with the 2015 spectacle of the Roads Must Fall campaign in South Africa and the subsequent Fees Must Fall movement. With student protests came epistemic debates around representation, inclusion and equality in the teaching, research and institutional practices of universities. These developments brought to the surface latent and long-standing contestations over knowledge and power, particularly in Africa. And many years of critique, for example, Ngugi Wationgo in his famous book, Decolonizing the Mind, have brought little change, reminding us that the need to recognize, reassert and reaffirm the centrality of marginalized individuals and communities and what matters to them remains as pressing as ever. In this context, an unfinished project on decolonizing scholarship therefore has to critically engage with meaning-making practices, as these underpin the most fundamental aspects of being human. Such a project also drives home the need for an Africa-wide engagement with the meanings of the past and how these are entangled with meanings of the present and the future. And beyond the moral charge to address colonial, epistemic and empirical injustices, decolonization also needs to reflect an understanding that power inequalities intersect. In celebrating Africa Day, decolonial scholarship from and on Africa remains necessary to ensure that the continent takes its rightful place as theoretical innovator rather than being a mere site for the application of Western theories or an empirical case study for generating practical knowledge or international policy. To challenge this state of affairs, we need to look for sources of theorizing in mundane spaces. Theorizing of the everyday will provide us with a new vocabulary to subvert traditional theories of state and world politics by including local civil society understandings of everyday security, as well as informal and hybrid forms of democracy and governance. It is against this background that Professor Mignola's lecture on the decolonial history of Haiti promises to offer innovative ways of seeing this region not as a place to be studied, but rather, in his words, as a place for thinking, living and reconstitution of the destitute. Thank you, Professor Hudson. We will now cross to Durham, North Carolina, for the Africa Day Memorial Lecture. Professor Mignolo, welcome. We are greatly honored and privileged to have you with us today, and we very much look forward to your lecture titled The Beauty of the Sovereign People, Jean Casimir and the Decolonial History of Haiti. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much. It was uh, really an honor to um, deliver a lecture in the African Day Memorial um, with the, kind of the long history of the celebration of these days and also the distinguished scholar that precedes me. I check on the list of people who have been uh, talking in this podium <laughs> in presence. And uh, I also thank uh, Dr. Sabelo Lobu Gassendi for, for accepting the comment. So my, my talk goes along the line of uh, his latest book, Epistemic Freedom in Africa. But, <clears throat> but of course, I cannot talk much about Africa because I, I mean, I am familiar, but I don't know that I'm not involved in the exciting time that I see that is happening in Africa now, uh, especially in the in the realm of art and thinking and uh, intellectual and scholarly production, which is not new because, I mean, if we just go back 70 years ago and start with the Cold War, the legacy of decolonization is big in Africa. Um, not, not only with the kind of the struggle to the foundation of the national, national states, 
which is always uh, ambiguous, as we know, in Africa, in Asia, and the Americas. But the intellectual and political legacy is uh, really enormous. So I cannot talk about that, but uh, I, my, my topic was from Haiti. So I uh, selected this topic, the power and beauty of the sovereign people, which is something Jean Casimir has been talking for a while now, but down, now he just published a monumental book. <clears throat> so I would like uh, the people seeing the screen reading this uh, statement. My position of strength come from observing the outside world through Haitian eyes. When I do the opposite, I place myself in a position of inferiority by accepting the definition uh, put in place by the gaze of another. I think that that shift in the geography of thinking and doing things and feeling is going on now around the world. Um, it's in Africa, it's in Asia, it's in South America, it's even invading Europe. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I will take, I will tell you a little bit about the book. I, I'm, it's not, it's not a talk uh, summarized in the book. I take a few points of the book to make a theoretical point. And the theoretical point is precisely what I just said, or what Casimir says, uh, observing the outside world through the eyes wherever we are, uh, geopolitically, but also body political, whatever, uh, whatever is our uh, kind of um, option, sexual option, uh, or, or religious, or uh, whatever, is we are kind of witnessing the end of Western universalism that was hegemonic, at least from 500, 1500 to 2000. So next, please. So I, I, I have four parts. I will just go one at a time. So the first part is, I don't know how familiar you are, but I imagine that a lot of people are not familiar with the Haitian revolution. And I imagine also that people who are familiar with the Haitian Revolution, they will be familiar with Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines and uh, Henri Christophe and all the kind of the heroes, the military heroes. And I will kind of uh, tell you a little bit about that to say that that is exactly not what Casimir is talking about. He's saying the Haitian Revolution is someplace else, is in the sovereignty of the people, not among the kind of the egos and the individual that uh, fought uh, for the power of the state. It's very interesting that uh, two of them, Toussaint and Dessalines, were killed. Uh, Henry Christophe killed himself, and the other four Big Petion is the only one, I think, that kind of died in a natural way. So next, please. So there is, a, there is a story that is very popular in Haiti. People believe it. Historians are divided. Some say that this may have happened. There are documents uh, of... Uh, there are documents of uh, the 18th century, some uh, historians of uh, Haiti of the 18th century. <clears throat> uh, so whether the Wakaiman meeting happened is doubtful, but that is, this is true, is true. It's true in the sense doesn't matter if it happened or not. It's true in the belief of the uh, of the sovereign people, and that is what ignited the revolution. Uh, that uh, well, and there is a long story here, but there was a key meeting in Wakaiman, and it's a kind of a place in the north of uh, of Haiti, 
<clears throat> with uh, Duthi Bokuman, who apparently was a big, a tremendous leader, a, good, a speaker, and Cecil Fatima, and they were kind of priests and priestess, priestess, as we said today. Or shaman, or you wanna, whatever you wanna call it. I mean, people who uh, embody a different kind of a spirituality than the kind of institutional spirituality of Christianity. Uh, so that that is, uh, and then to Saint Louverture and the heroes of the revolution, to Saint Louverture and the Saline, come later. To Saint Louverture was more like a, a black, as liberated that the kind of a, a slave owner too. So he belonged, he belonged to the elite or the oligarch, as Casimir will say. And uh, Bookman apparently came from Jamaica. So next. So uh, this is to give you something. I mean, Wakaiman, uh, whether it happened or not, uh, is true. Uh, so it was the first black independent nation in the world. This, this is the official, the official, uh, the official version, right? Um, <clears throat> so it represents a union of slaves belonging to different tribes and speaking different languages. So Casimir will question this, not Wakaiman. He will question is that this is a slave revolt. But I will tell you why he's questioning in a minute. So the colonists tolerated all the noisy because of, apparently the, uh, the, the slave captives, they used to dance and have this kind of ritual in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the plantations, but uh, they were kind of apprehensive and uh, fearful of the voodoo. So the voodoo uh, apparently came from uh, Africa, but uh, uh, like everything in the new world, uh, acquire a different uh, texture and a different meaning because of the say 400,000 people or, uh, at the time of the revolution in Haiti. Uh, they were coming from different parts of Central Asia, uh, Central Africa and uh, and, and West Africa. So they they came from different kingdom, they, they came from different languages, they, they came with different kind of spirituality, but uh, they have a common diverse experience and then have the experience of the Middle Passage and the horrible experience of the Middle Passage and then the horrible experience or being uh, uh, exploited and enslaved in the plantation. So that the point of Casimir uh, is that this kind of be began to create a bondage among them. So when Wakaiman happened, apparently a week before or two weeks before was a big meeting of people kind of uh, from uh, hundreds of plantation and then Wakaiman kind of concentrated leaders of each plantation. So was something already um, happening there? So after Wakaiman, they, uh, two days later, they began to kind of kill plantation owner, white, French, uh, burning the plantation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, the uprising was, was the uprising of the people. And the heroes then kind of uh, took advantage of that with their capacity of leadership, etc. So next, please. So briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, the French arrived to Saint-Domingue before it was called Haiti. Uh, Saint-Domingue is the name, uh, the French name, uh, and that France acquired half of the island. Uh, from the Spanish, and they control it. That they, they control the plantation economy, which was very productive. I mean, uh, Haiti. I mean, the Saint Domingue was the pearl of the Caribbean. Huh? But in 1791, a few days uh, after uh, Bois Caiman, uh, the revolution began, and the revolution began and kind of closed in 1804. At that time. Uh, Toussaint was already uh, killed, uh, 
that I won't tell you the story about that. And uh, Desalin became the first kind of king of Haiti. He really cut the connection with France because Toussaint was trying to kind of negotiate. Uh, and he changed the name to Haiti. And Haiti comes from Haiti. That was the name that the Tainos and Arawak, the indigenous people of the Caribbean, named the place. But Tainos and Arawak were mostly exterminated. So the French and the Spanish and the British were kind of uh, fighting for the position. So to Saint Louverture, um, there is the dying France captured by a Napoleon order and transported to France and died in prison. And Jean-Jacques Ladasselin uh, was assassinated. So that gives you an idea. Uh, this is the background. Casimir doesn't talk about that because the sovereignty of the people is the sovereignty with the back to the state. Next, please. So now I will give you a little bit of context of who is Jean Casimir and why uh, he brought this book. Um, and I want to kind of under, underscore first that um, he sees himself as a descendant of the sovereign people. So these people are his ancestor, not to send over to or Desalines or all those people who kind of control the state. Next, please. So there is um, uh, his base on Haiti. Um, he was uh, ambassador uh, to the United Nations during the Aristides time. That was one of the president of Haiti. It's very difficult to uh, count the president in Haiti because every two, three or four years or less, they change. And, and this is a book uh, I will kind of take some points in order to make my theoretical points. So next, please. So this is why he writes this book. He said, if the reader asks what I have learned from writing this book that I know offered to them, my answer is that above all, I learned how I live my personal life. That is very interesting. He's, he's a trained sociologist and uh, he that is a storytelling. The book is a storytelling with constant theoretical reflection. So, and this is the second point, very important. I don't see, I, I, I no longer see my ancestor as former slaves. I don't even think of them as a dominated class. Their misery is only the most superficial aspect of the reality. It is reality that colonialists prefer to emphasize along with those among them who oppose uh, the cruelty of some colonists. Uh, so he doesn't see himself as he doesn't see Toussaint or the Saline, uh, his ancestor. But, and he doesn't see them as slaves, but as captives, enslaved captives. So captives is a decolonial concept in a Casimir storytelling and reflection. And a slave is a modern colonial concept. This is uh, crucial. So I have chosen to venerate them, to honor these captives reduced to slavery. And those emancipated, because they were emancipated Blacks, African, before, but the Black emancipated, they kind of joined forces with the oligarchy. So uh, said, to, honor, to honor the captives, and also those emancipated in thanks for their military service to colonialism. I do so despite their errors and their occasion, occasional failures. So he respect, he recognized the Toussaint Louverture, the Desalines and all that, but 
that is not her ancestry. So he basically honors the captives who will achieve the beauty and power of the sovereignty of the people. Uh, next, please. So uh, the, the third part is where he questioned that the Haitian was the first successful slave revolution. This is a modern Western concept in, in Casimir argument, which uh, I, I, I accept. <laughs> so they were captive, they were human being captive that were enslaved, trained to work in the plantation as a slave. They were not a slave by professional coming from Africa already knowing what to do. They had to be trained as a slave. Next, please. So then uh, some basic points about how the uh, sovereignty of the people emerged. Remember that until uh, there are 13 years of revolt, 1781-1804. Several things happened there, and one of the things happened uh, with Toussaint uh, already is that to liberate them, to liberate the uh, the captives, for personal reasons. One of the reasons that he needed an army to fight against England, but he also was a kind of very strong hand to maintain forced labor. So that was a kind of tension uh, soon began to appear between the, the people, the captives that were all kind of together and the state. Uh, in that case, to send, but they began to see the state as a problem, not as, 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 as an institution that will solve their problem. You know? Uh, so in that sense, Casimir said the country was uh, the one of its size to emerge from a non-Creole. The majority was people coming from Africa in the last kind of delivery from a kind of the, uh, the, 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 the ship, the, the boat that translated it. Um, so Haiti emerged as a nation so he makes a difference between the state. It's not a nation state. It's a state, it's an administrative state. Uh, but the nation is someplace else. So Haiti emerged from an aggregate, the nation emerged from an aggregate of foreigners, right? the African, who in solidarity with one another converted themselves into a sovereign, he called it indigenous, right? nation under the protection of military bureaucracy. The military bureaucracy is the state that uh, Toussaint and, and the Saline trying to found. So what's interesting here is that the population was about 400,000 by 1804, but by the end of the century it was close to 2 million. Why is this important? Because there is no people coming from Africa anymore. So the people regenerate themselves. And that is where the, the, the kind of the regenerate, but also through the 19th century, organize themselves. Organize themselves in many ways, but around what's called the Laku. The Laku is a territory, uh, if you are familiar with um, with the Zapatistas, well, probably as uh, very, and perhaps, I don't know very well, perhaps something like Lesotho. So there is a kind of independent territoriality, the LACU, uh, within the administration, the administration of the state that cannot fail to form a nation state. So the sovereign people, and, and, and what is important that in that recon, re, reconstruct, re, uh, constitution, construction of the LACU and the sovereignty of the people, women began to have a very important role, not only to regeneration of the species, but also to the organization of the communal. 
So the sovereign people impose their system without much effort. Why? Because the administration, the state was worried with France and Spain and, and, uh, and England and also their own kind of interest of the leader. So that's why they kill each other. The sovereign people impose their system without much effort and they further develop their self-sufficiency by continuing to absorb ample part of the urban. So they kind of remain in the country. They have already, Toussaint gave them pieces of land. Uh, they were not trying to expropriate the land of the plantation because some of the plantation uh, remain, not with a slave, a slave people, but we kind of labor. So this process, not always uh, without conflict, ended in 1915 with the U.S. occupation. So what's important here is that Haiti, the population goes close to a million, to uh, two millions. Uh, the Laku and the sovereign people organize themselves, organize their life with markets, with small towns, with pieces of land, with a school, with their own kind of medicine that um, they know by uh, tradition. So next, please. So in that sense, uh, Casimir will argue, they cannot be a revolutionary, a, a revolution of slaves. <laughs> What's a revolution of the captives? human being captive and he put a lot of accent here because if you talk about revolutionary slaves he said revolutionary slaves can only exist in the nightmare of the traders and the colonists right uh, <clears throat> not captive and and you see the coexistence of the two vocabularies and that is very very important to understand the point I began to make and I will close by kind of stressing it. It's not that the slave will kind of replace or kind of in a modern way supersede a slave. No, that the, the terminology uh, coexists in conflictive way. Uh, the administration continues to Talk about slaves, even if there were black people oligarch in the administration, like Toussaint and other people. So in the Haitian case, this makes it impossible to comprehend the content of revolutionary thought. You see the point. Slaves don't think. <laughs> slaves are just brute force of the body to cut sugar cane or cotton or whatever. But Casimir twists the place around. No, there is thought here. Without thought, without thinking, you cannot organize yourself as people. Now, that's, this thought is not academic thought and doesn't have to be academic thought. But at the same time, you cannot, we cannot forget that people think. And when people don't find their situation uh, satisfactory or oppressive, etc., they don't only think, they think about how to get out of it. And that is what the kind of the revolution began to happen among the people. So the experience, knowledge, feeling, and religious practice of the classes in the struggle are overlooked. And that is where Casimir put the accent in people thinking. Uh, not just the, not, and this is important because he's a sociologist writing a history, but the sociologist, he can just describe uh, uh, the, the, the people thought as something outside of himself or just describe people's action and not thought. Mm -hmm. But it so happened that if the captives are his ancestor, that thought 
is the thought that is in him beyond sociology and historiography, beyond the discipline. So in that sense, Casimir is an undisciplinary thinker because he brings his training, but also he brings the thinking of his ancestor. So conceiving of something called a slave revolution perpetuates an oxymoron by seeking the cause in the philosophy of the slave owners and the slave traders far away uh, from the actual thought of the victim. So in that sense, Casimir insists the Haitian revolution have nothing to do with France. That is a version of the French, that the Enlightenment and the French Revolution influences, yeah, may have influenced the Saline and Toussaint, but not the people. That Casimir kind of writes this story as a sociologist, but also embodying the thinking of the sovereign people transmitted generation after generation since 1804, but also before. Because if the sovereign people arrive to this kind of unity is because they have two previous experience. The experience of their life in Africa that whatever it was could not have been as bad as the plantation and could not have been as bad as the long uh, middle passage in the Atlantic. So that was in everybody's bodies and in everybody's mind to kind of... So he's, that's why he put the accent on, on the thinking, um, kind of uh, what is in them. So, uh, if you you don't you don't see the the screen, but the next the next slide is titled "Shifting the Geopolitic of Knowing, Sensing, and Believing." So that is related to what I just have been saying since the beginning, <clears throat> that Casimir shift and see the world through the eyes of himself as a Haitian but because of the uh, ancestrality of the people, the sovereign people. So he said at some point, the beauty, not the state, <laughs> that was not beautiful at all. <laughs> the beauty of the Haitian revolution come from the invention of a people. They invented themselves as a nation. And that is crucial in the crucial point is this argument. We must give the people credit for this victory, for having canceled the impact of official institution derived from the colonists. The colonists who were racist and were Eurocentric, <coughs> that have a Eurocentric model of governance. He, they create a different way of governance. So the LACU is communal. It's not the pyramidal political theory of the West, in which Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines and Christophe fell. And they want to be the hero and kind of be on the top of the pyramid. So the culture of the captives was and remains a response to slavery. So cannot be a slave revolution because the people was a response uh, to slavery. No? So the people, said Casimir, anchor their sovereignty by exercising it locally. So Haitian thought did not come from France or elsewhere. It was produced through local social relations. So it was the Haitian peasantry that reconstituted themselves in opposition to the processes 
of being destitute, first by the French monarchy, and second by the state of the revolutionary individual like Toussaint and, and Dessalines. Gender relation in this kind of reconstitution, family, de la coup, collective property. I mean, he still lives in a collective property, Casimir himself. So he told me many times, if I, I want to, I cannot sell my house because my house is not mine. I mean, my house is a kind of uh, extended family property. So gender relation, family, the Lacou, collective property, voodoo, rural markets, garden town, garden towns is a form around a small uh, pieces of land, leisure, draft, uh, 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 and the arts, craft and the arts. So Casimir always said, what we, what we can export to the world is joy. <laughs> uh, so because they in, invented, reinvent, invented and reinvented the life they had before. So uh, you don't see the, the PowerPoint yet. So now we go to part four. So part three was to kind of make you or tell you uh, a little bit more about what Casimir understand and means by the beauty and power of the sovereign people. So the part four is the decolonial task today <clears throat> that I call it nociological and aesthetic twofold reconstitutions. Too bad that you can see, can see the slide because this can be probably a little bit tricky to explain without the slides. I mean, without seeing this in the screen. So decolonial task of nociological and aesthetic. Why? Nociological anesthetic. So, nociological, I took it from Valentine Budimbe in his kind of groundbreaking book, The Invention of Africa of 1988. <clears throat> he introduced the concept of nociology because he said, I was asked to uh, write a report about African philosophy. But when I start kind of getting into African ways of thinking, <clears throat> and the kind of the, the 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 coexistence and power relation between philosophy and thinking, o sea, thinking philosophically and thinking for living coexist coexist in a power differential. So he goes, uh, then he goes into kind of dealing with this issue, looking at basically the human science, how the Western anthropologists and sociologists describe Africa and how African train in uh, Western, <clears throat> Western discipline kind of deal with Africa, but also with the Western view of Africa. So you see that uh, there the power differential because for Western uh, French or German or, or uh, uh, in a British anthropologist, that is not the problem. <laughs> but for Africa and for Latin America, for Asia, that is the problem. The problem is that this way of thinking, the way of living, but now they come the discipline to discipline us. And, yet, and we have to do deal with that. And I think epistemic freedom in Africa, uh, Sabelo is dealing with that. <clears throat> And Mudimbe began to see that, um, in it. but he said gnosis. Uh, well, gnosis in, in the in the mentality of the West have a bad reputation because it is associated with kind of a uh, obscure, mysterious way of knowing. And uh, so, yeah, the Gnostic were kind of a, a, a dissident sect or group of from Christianity, at the same time, very intelligent. But we don't have to understand by Gnosis how the group of Gnostic understood Gnosis. Gnosis is a, a Greek word who means knowledge. But Mudimbe is clear about 
a kind of knowledge that is neither doxa, not opinion, and not epistemology, which is become in the West the principle of uh, how can I say serious knowledge, <laughs> uh, basically philosophical, secular philosophy and secular science, because before that the serious knowledge was theology, epistemology of Christian uh, theology. So for me, it's very important. That is not the Casimir. That is a, a, is me that introduced uh, reintroduce after moving by the concept of gnosis because. Uh, while it's okay to talk about epistemology and say African or Latin America or indigenous epistemology, still we maintain the term epistemology. And we have to say indigenous epistemology and modern epistemology because it cannot be epistemology universal just like that. So, nociology is knowing, but all kinds of knowing, including scientific knowledge including quantum theory. That is a specific way of gnosis that is kind of called quantum physics and kind of respond to the principle of Western epistemology. So the same with aesthesis or aesthetic, aesthetic in, in this term. Uh, aesthesis we know is another word, uh, Greek, that means sensing, sensation what we feel, eh? kind of related to emotion, all that was repressed by epistemology, but was also repressed and destituted by Western aesthetic. So what I am doing here is uh, reconstituting, knowing and sensing through nociology that include epistemology and aesthetics that include aesthetics. And so I derive that from Mudim, uh, but I already did that kind of uh, connection with Mudim in, in, in 2000 when I published uh, when I published uh, local history, global design, coloniality, border thinking, and coloniality, border thinking. Uh, no, so Walter knowledge and border thinking. So border thinking is nociological. Uh, more than uh, kind of epistemic, even if we have for certain purpose to follow certain rule of scholarship, to be heard in certain audience. So, uh, twofold uh, reconstitution, why? Because Casimir is doing two things at the same time. He's reconstituting the content of the Haitian Revolution. For example, changing, talking about captive, um, captive thought and the knowledge I created, they already, he already stepped out of the discipline that they study at the Haitian Revolution. They study the people, but they don't think with the people. Uh, what Casimir is doing is that kind of nociology, but that nociology is, is a physics, a physics, a physics too, and uh, and that is why uh, Casimir, through the book, is constantly reflecting on himself, on what is he doing, and you don't find that in sociology uh, studies or in even in anthropology studies, uh, in historiographical studies. So at the same time that he reconstitute the content, the history of the Haiti, he reconstitutes nociology or reconstitutes epistemology translated into nociology, right? So that is a kind of, he began to dwell in the border and in that dwelling in the border, the body dwelling in the border is that allows him to tell the story that he told and I am kind of reducing to you. So uh, <clears throat> I already talked here. So the, the next point is to say a little bit more about what just said. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, the twofold reconstitution, nociological, 
But the two fold reconstitution is not just nociological anesthetics. The two fold reconstitution is reconstituting the content of the conversation, the enunciated, what he said, and reconstituting the saying, the enunciation, the term of the conversation, the term of the conversation that are controlled by the discipline, the discipline of history, and in this case, the discipline of uh, sociology, the social, the, the human social science, as Mudimbe <coughs> uh, kind of reflected in the invention of Africa. So I will tell you a little bit more about, uh, because I told you uh, some already about the enunciator, how he sees, how can reconstitute the history of Haiti that he called the colonial history from the perspective of the captive, what they did, what they think, etc. So let's kind of pause on the enunciation and this kind of constant reflection that Jean Casimir introduced chapter after chapter. So I will kind of read you a couple, starting with the first one. So I told you at the end, I will, <laughs> I will come back uh, to the quotation I gave you um, in the title. Uh, <clears throat> you may not remember now, but he said, my position of strength comes from observing the outside world through the Haitian eyes. I hope that after everything I said, this sentence has a new meaning. When I do the opposite, I place myself in a position of inferiority. So that is why he refused not to write the book from the, pers from the position of sociology or the historiography, because he puts himself in inferiority, right? Uh, is kind of a common assumption that Haitian sociologists cannot be like Max Weber or Talcott Parson, or Anthony Giddens, right? Uh, this kind of, the dependency is not just economical and political, it's kind of epistemic de dependency, that is where no, the liberation is sociological, an aesthetic, aesthetic liberation of Western epistemology. So he said in another part of the book, my task is to find out how Haitian created themselves and how they recover from Europe, the traders and the oligarchs and the colonists. In doing so, and this is crucial for the kind of the body politics, uh, geo body politics, in doing so, I enrich my life as a Haitian and as a result, I can share that richness with entire humanity. It is not my job to decide whether I have done well or badly. I simply want to be able to look at myself as I am with my own eyes. eyes. That is kind of dwelling in the border. He is just putting himself and the memory of the ancestor in front of the discipline. He is not trying to kind of change the discipline. He has a strain, but he has another experience, and that is dwelling in the border. Dwelling in the border, so the point of view of the oppressed, the oppressed, said Casimir, develops from what is inside and moves toward the outside. It is the inversion of the path of oppression that is always been that way. That is, you look from outside into the, the inside. So if you look at, if you look at uh, Haiti from Europe or from the social sciences, well, you put yourself in position and inferiority. Okay, I will... Uh, I will kind of conclude that I have more detail, but it's more dif difficult to, uh, I will say one more thing, uh, one more thing to just the conclusion. So after all of that, 
I read Casimir as a nosiological and aesthetic argument involving his personal geobody political lo lo location and his undisciplinary location and his dwelling in the borders. And I will say one more thing. Dwelling and thinking in the borders are the decolonial conditions of for nosiological and aesthetic twofold <laughs> reconstitution. So the twofold reconstitution is how we change our enunciation, how we change the term of the conversation. And how you change the term of the conversation, changing the question. Changing the question that are prompted by the discipline. So the double, the twofold reconstitution is to reconstitute the enunciated, but to reconstitute it, to, uh, 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 starting from our own enunciation. And that for me is our two or one and two fundamental decolonial, sociological and aesthetic uh, task of our time. Not the only one, of course sociological and aesthetic reconstitution. Well, thank you very much. I hope that uh, we I made some sense, even if we couldn't see. Thank you, Professor Mignolo, for this insightful and provocative lecture. I will now call on Professor Sabello Jane Lovogacene, extraordinary professor in the Center for Gender and African Studies at the University of the Free State, and full professor and chair of Epistemologies of the Global South at the University of Bayreuth in Germany, to respond to and to help us reflect on Professor Mignolo's lecture. Over to you, Professor. No, thank you so much. Thank you, Walter, for the, for the lecture. And uh, let me try to reflect on, a, on a four, if not five issues. And I think it's a very relevant uh, presentation for an event organized on, uh, on the basis of the Africa Day, in the sense that you are really talking about the African people who have been captured, uprooted from their homes, transported across the oceans to labor in the plantations uh, in, the, in, in, in other parts of the world. And uh, secondly, I want also to reflect on the issue of fighting for for liberation. And I think he, your presentation also touched on that. And then the third issue which I will reflect on is the issue of sovereignty of the people. And then maybe I will end with a reflection on revolutionary thought. Uh, <clears throat> beginning uh, with a, you opened up with a very interesting uh, take from from Jean Casimir, which speaks about where do we see the world from? Uh, is it from our own eyes, or we see the world through other people's eyes? And I think that's what emerges there in terms of uh, seeing from the eyes of the Haitian people rather than seeing them through the gaze of others. And I think that that is an important part of uh, seeing ourselves better in the universe. And I think Nguk uh, Wationgo <clears throat> also emphasizes on the same point when he speaks about decolonization as something which means seeing ourselves clearly in relation to others in the universe. And uh, moving on to point number two, which is about which is about liberation. I think there are a number of lessons we can learn from there. That uh, liberation thought involves also changing our vocabularies and uh, also changing the namings. For instance, uh, the whole issue of enslavement is one which is very problematic in many ways because uh, there is a popular naming like transatlantic slave trade, which actually creates an impression that first it was the ocean which actually 
uh, is responsible for enslaving people and they need heights, the people who actually enslaved the people. Then uh, from Kashmir, we then learn that that word, to use the word slaves, is actually very wrong because those people were not slaves. It was people who were free, sovereign, uh, who were captured, then enslaved. So he introduces the question of enslaved people or captive. And that I think is very important. And but what is also important in relation to the Africa Day is the issue of uh, people fighting for their own freedom, uh, drawing from their own uh, resources. And here, the resources which they drew from included the spirituality, particularly the voodoo, uh, and that spirituality being itself a container of knowledge. And I think that 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 is very important. And this also this idea of people fighting for their own uh, freedom, and also countering Eurocentric thought, took me to also reflect on the whole story of abolition and the emancipation, the idea that uh, the enslaved people or the captive people were, were emancipated. And they, when you think about that, they always privilege people like Wil William Wilberforce and many others, and they ignore the whole struggle by the people themselves. And I think that's where the epic Asian revolution actually stands to show that from the time of capture, from the time of transportation, from the time of subjection uh, within the plantations, there is nobody who ever accepted enslavement. People were always fighting for, mm -hmm. for freedom uh, mm -hmm. in, within that context. And then the other important aspect then becomes the, the knowledge aspect of it. When the book itself, there is a clear argument that it is not written from a discipline a perspective. It actually is a book which is written from the people perspective, uh, whereby the enslaved people are then understood as people who know and as knowers. And I think that's what emerges clearly there. Then the, the, the other important issue which emerged from Walter's uh, uh, presentation is the issue of the sovereignty of the people and that it made me to think a lot uh, about Africa. Who is the embodiment of sovereignty? Is it the state or the people? And here the emphasis is that it is the people who are the embodiment of sovereignty. Uh, and the state sovereignty is actually more representative of the elites. And this idea that uh, Jean Kashmir emphasizes that this revolution was a revolution of the captives and they tries to downplay this 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 narrative which were given that they were individuals heroes uh, a few heroes who actually led the revolution and then it sidelines the people and i think even when we talk about uh, liberation struggles in in africa we tend also to privilege the leadership or uh, rather than the people who really uh, carried out the the the, the struggles and I think that is that is very important. And I, and what actually also interested me, and which I think is very important for us on the on the continent, is the issue of revolutionary thought. Where does revolutionary thought come from? Uh, and this idea that the revolutionary thought came from uh, French or France. Uh, here in this talk, it was challenged in the sense that. It was the people themselves thinking they are ex from their existential conditions and thinking about changing their circumstances. And then they fought uh, for their own liberation. And then the emphasis is that revolutionary thought, they must actually be the primacy of thinking itself before a revolution can happen. And uh, we here see people who have been subjected to one of the most heinous uh, systems of exploitation the, the, the system of enslavement, but still they thought they mobilized and they fought successfully against 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 uh, uh, the system of enslavement, racism, and the colonialism. And then uh, uh, I think uh, then uh, uh, Walter tried to to uh, 
he went took us through what are the lessons from this and he took us to the issue of of the shifting uh geographies of knowledge seeing the world from the sovereign people a uh, people inventing themselves as a nation and they uh, and they uh, indeed throwing from their their own their own uh, experiences and uh, this took us also to the issue of uh, uh what uh, walter introduced as nociology which actually enabled us then to to perhaps critique epistemology as a bit limited and the perhaps use nociology which actually encompasses all forms of of knowing and the, i thought that was important as well and the and the and the i think the last issue is really about this a uh, decolonial uh, task today uh, which is a task which uh, across the world today the primacy of uh, of of thinking and the knowledge uh, as as part and parcel of imagining a better future and i think i will leave it at this thank you so much thank you thank you Salome. very good summary thank thank you professor sabello um professor walter um would you like to respond to to professor sabello's um uh, well, uh, yes, yes, I, I would like to say something. I very, I think that he um, <clears throat> he pick up uh, the main points I was making. So the only thing I could, would like to say is just not to repeat all of them to kind of stress uh, two points that are kind of connected, no? Uh, and it's very relevant today for Africa for um, for all over, but especially uh, all the region of the world that were former colonies. <clears throat> uh, uh, being former colonies means that the nation state is not the form of governance that emerged in Africa or in South America or in Asia or Central Asia. The nation state is a European uh, institution uh, that created by the emerging bourgeoisie of the late uh, 18th century, those who made their <clears throat> French Revolution and the Great Revolution in England. But then the nation state became a weapon for colonial expansion. And so the problem that the nation state outside of Europe, even in Europe now in the United States, is the nation state shows the limit. But in the former colonies, there is a different kind of issue. And I think that uh, to put all the, the marbles or all the money into sovereignty of the state, following Casimir, and I agree with him, kind of re uh, keep us dependent. So, and I think Isabella stressed that the question of sovereignty of the people. Uh, it's not the question of just saying the, the uh, sovereignty of the people, but I think it's coming. Uh, I mean, we know a small, we, we know Haiti, we know the Zapatista, we know Rojava. We know today in Chile and Colombia what is happening. We know that apartheid finally uh, ended. So. Uh, the sovereignty of the people is becoming more and more aware within the people itself. And that is why I think the book of Casimir at this point in time is very, very important to kind of shift the attention from the sovereignty of the state to the sovereignty of the people. Not that we have to abandon the sovereignty of the state, but it's not either or, it's and and. And that is the second point that I think is very important is uh the sovereignty the sovereignty of thought and the revolution in thought and the revolution in thought cannot come from the discipline we cannot our generation we cannot avoid the discipline for many 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 reasons but we don't have any obligation anymore to follow uh the the regulation the disciplinary regulation and the change of vocabulary is fundamental 
uh, Casimir change of captive, uh, a slave or captive. And uh, in my case, it's just kind of start thinking nociological and aesthetically instead of epistemological and aesthetic. We cannot eliminate those. Coexist, but coexist in power differential. And the power differential is for us to make aesthetic and epistemology part of nociology. Uh, and that I think is, uh, I mean, again, it's not a question of declaration and it's not perhaps those two terms I selected this afternoon, but the question is that from the South, I would say from the global South, but also from the global East, <laughs> uh, this is happening. So people began to realize that they have their own knowledge, their own nociology. And the question is that aesthetic is there. I mean, uh, our epistemology is there, but again, it's very limited, it's very provincial, as uh, Chakrabarti would say. It's the way that the European talk about themselves, and that is okay. I have no problem while they talk uh, uh, about epistemology and aesthetic about themselves. But we, we cannot accept anymore the aberration. And the aberration is that only epistemology as uh, thinking knowledge is acceptable and aesthetic and art that everybody has to judge and conduct and think and feel themselves according to those regulations. So sovereignty of the people and sovereignty of thought <clears throat> and revolution of the people and revolution of the thought goes together. Thank you, Professor. This has been a fascinating topic. You have given us so much food for thought. As the event draws to a close, Dr. Munyarazi Mashonga, the Program Director of the Program for Africa Studies in the Center for Gender and Africa Studies, will do the vote of thanks. But first, let me highlight the important work of the No Student Hungry Program at the University of the Free State. At this moment in time, we find ourselves living through a life-altering and life-threatening historical event. Our world, our very social being is being reshaped in indelible ways. At the University of the Free State, even under the best of times, many of our students have to overcome challenges, including food insecurity, to complete their degrees in order to build a better future for themselves. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded the food insecurity, threatening so many of our students. In honor of our speaker tonight, Professor Mignolo, we have made a donation to the No Student Hungry program and we hope our contribution will make a positive impact in the lives of students in need. Let us take a quick look at the sterling work done by this program. If you would like to support the important work of this initiative, you may visit the university website at www.ufs.ac.za for more information. First US President. George Washington. What's the biggest planet in our solar system? Uh, Jupiter. How long is a nanosecond? One billionth of a second. The current world chess champion? This, this one, Nathan Anand. The River Jordan flows out of which sea? Dead Sea. Where's your next meal going to come from? The No Student Hungry program provides our students in need with an allowance for a meal of the day at a Pacific dining hall on campus. Students are selected in terms of financial need and a commitment to give back to the community. The program allows students to focus on their studies without worrying about their next meal, thus increasing their chances to excel academically and ultimately obtain their degree. This will in turn have a positive effect on poverty reduction in our country. In 2011, a research study conducted by the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics indicated that 59% of our students' populations suffer from food insecurity. More recent studies also confirm that student food insecurity is a reality among university students. The South African Survey of Student Engagement Annual Report in 2016 indicated that 77% of our first generation students ran out of food without being able to afford food for the rest of the month. These are often students with strong academic records, 
but without adequate funding for regular meals, and this is why students' well-being will remain a priority at the University of the Free State. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on where you are on this beautiful planet of ours. My name is Mnyara Dimshonga. I am the Program Director for Africa Studies at the University of the Free State. My task this evening is a very simple one, to pass a vote of thanks. There are so many individuals, groups of individuals, organizations, departments, and units to thank, and I'm not sure if I will be able to mention all of them. If I omit you or your organization or department, please accept my apologies. It is not deliberate. However, allow me to single out the following. First, the sovereign people of Haiti, not Haiti. Thank you for making it possible to learn from your experiences and shared memories, your daily practice of living in re-existence and building the communal, not as vanquished slaves, but as a collective of fighters who created a sovereign society in the midst of dehumanization and disenfranchisement. Thank you, the sovereign people of Haiti. Second, Professor Walter D. Mignolo, thank you for being the messenger of this beautiful message from the sovereign people of Haiti to the sovereign people of Africa. You handed down the message with refreshing clarity and directness. For me, the best takeaway from this message is to recognize what Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie calls the danger of a single story, highlighting the importance of where we start telling our stories and how dangerous it is to assume that there is only one place to start the story an aberration that needs dismantling and destituting. Thank you for helping us to find the center of the periphery by recentering Africa as a place for thinking, living, and reconstitution of the destituted into a sovereign people and society, rather than being a testing ground of Western hallucinations. Like Jean Casmias himself, instead of using the sovereign people to advance scholarship, you use the scholarship to advance the cause of the sovereign people. In addition, thank you, Prof. Mignolo, for the kind donation to the No Student Hungry campaign. For your information, at UFS, between 15 to 20 percent of our students study while hungry, and you understood that it is impossible to feed the mind while the body is hungry. Thank you very much, Prof. Musichima ashi gracias. Tangi, yalibuwa, atenda. To Professor Savelo Jane Yuvugacheni, thank you for not only being the erudite discussion tonight, but also for helping us to get Walter on board. On 17 October 2019, I dispatched an invitation to Walter to give the 2020 Africa Day Lecture. When two weeks went by without hearing from him, I ran to you to assist me to breach his strong defenses. The tactic worked immediately. But suddenly in 2020, the world was enveloped in a deadly pandemic, leaving the 2020 lecture hanging in the balance. Good people, guess who rescued us? It was none other than Professor Yovu Gacheni, who stepped in within eight days of my SOS to deliver the first virtual Africa Day lecture while reserving Walter for 2021. Professor Yovu Gacheni, it is gratifying to see how committed you are to the UFS project. We owe you a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you very much, Prof. To the Rector and Vice-Chancellor of the University of the Free State, Professor Francis Peterson, thank you for creating time in your packed schedule to be with us on this special day. Thank you for your tireless role in increasing the visibility and impact of the Center for Gender and Africa Studies and the University of the Free State. To the Dean of the Faculty of the Humanities, Professor Hyde Hudson, thank you for the welcoming and introducing Walter in a language that he knows best, the idea of toy-toying and theorizing from the margins. In addition, thank you, Dean, for being an email or phone call away when we need your advice and guidance. To the Director for the Center for Gender and Africa Studies, Dr. Stephanie Kewood, Thank you for making sure that 2021 Africa Day Lecture comes to life. Your forward planning, remote sensing, 
and attention to detail is second to none. To the director of the Office for International Affairs, Cornelius Hagamaya, thank you very much for your passion. Thank you and everyone from your office for all the preparatory work behind the scenes. To the UFS ICT department and the communication and marketing office, thank you for all the technical support and for widely advertising the lecture on various platforms. The two of you know how to keep our website busy, beautiful, and appealing at the same time. Keep it up. To effort clients from Royston, our webinar host for tech. Thank you for your technical and logistical arrangements to bring the lecture to the comfort of our homes and offices without any technical glitches. To the Odayoni School of Music and the Odayoni String Quartet, thank you for the melodious, soothing musical item that transported us into outer space and a world outside the present. To Anizile, Senior Officer at COVID Support Services, your able coordination of the non-student hungry campaign does not go unnoticed. To Sikhia Salman, Senior Assistant Officer at SIGAS, thank you for all the skillful coordination and organizational logistics from start to finish. Last but not least, a heart thank you to all the participants. You were what football fanatics call the 12th man, encouraging and motivating Walter to score more goals. Indeed, he scored them freely as he was motivated by seeing and sensing your presence, albeit remotely. Thank you very much, the beautiful sovereign people of Africa and all those who believe in the, in the reconstitution of the destituted. Hashtag One Africa Together Forever. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mashonga. Um, I think I'm going to conclude this this evening. Um, it was not it was not the program we planned entirely, but I don't think it detracted from the power and the insight of of your lecture, Professor Manuela. I, we cannot express our, our gratefulness um, and the privilege that we feel having you tonight. And we hope in future, once we get beyond the challenges we have to, at this point in terms of COVID. Um, we hope to welcome you in Bloemfontein with Sabelo in future. Um, we're looking very much forward to that. Um, I think that is also what we are missing in this time, is the, connect the connections between right. people, the, the interpersonal. Mm -hmm. So we really cannot wait um, to, to have a future Africa Day uh, commemorations in person. Um, we're looking forward to that, and we hope to welcome you to South Africa and Bloemfontein in future. Thank you so much. Um, everyone you. else? for sticking with us in spite of the challenges. My heart will thanks for this. Um, I hope you stay safe. Um, we are moving into a third wave, so I hope everyone stays safe and, and keeps healthy. And um, until we meet again in future. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, well, yeah, there was all uh, the inconvenient, but if the message got through, that is what counts. <laughs> and I think it got through. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.